We want to uh, welcome you all to uh, our final Keystone conversation of the year um, in coordination with the Denton's Law Firm. Uh, my name's Clint Vince. In a moment, we'll get underway with uh, Christine Scanlon. We'll probably wait just another minute or two because we know we have uh, a lot of participants today. We want to give them a chance to join. I'm Christine Scanlon, as Clint mentioned. I'm president and CEO of the Keystone Policy Center. We're a nonprofit organization based in Keystone, Colorado, with offices in Denver and Washington, D.C. Our mission is to empower leaders to reach common higher ground. And for the more than 45 years, we've accomplished that mission through holding rich discussions like the one we're going to have today. Thank you particularly to Clint Vince and Denton's uh, for partnering with us on this conversation. Clint serves on Keystone's Board of Trustees, as does Paula Gold Williams as our board chair, who will be a part of the dialogue today. I also want to thank the esteemed leaders joining us and appreciate all the people who have come in online to watch this important conversation. Today's webinar is the latest in our key conversation series, which we kicked off earlier this year with policy policymakers, congressional leaders, and other key policy influencers. We've had discussions on the Middle East, on uh, law enforcement relationships with communities of color and other timely and important conversations. If you're interested in joining us for more of these events uh, as part of the Key Conversations outreach, uh, please sign on to our website at keystone.org and sign up to receive other updates. Uh, given the subject of today's discussion, I also want to take a moment to briefly introduce a project that Keystone has been leading, and that also includes participation from both Clint and Paula Gold-Williams. And the topic is uh, decarbonization, also reflected in today's conversation. We're convening a cross-sectoral group of power, transportation, and policy, ag policy in agriculture experts to discuss decarbonization that will ultimately produce a consensus-based document that is both bipartisan and impactful. So thank you, Clint and Paula, for your very key participation and leadership in that effort. And we'll be releasing those uh, recommendations sometime in mid-February aimed at the federal policy level. So again, timely uh, topic, important discussion. And Clint, we could not have done this without you. So thank you, and with that, I will turn it over to Clint Vince as our moderator for this discussion. Thank you, Clint. Thank you so much, Christine, and uh, welcome to our audience. Um, and thank you, Christine, for your amazing leadership of Keystone through this uh, daunting year um, and, and uh, the many years that you've served as CEO. As Christine mentioned, we're going to start in a moment with a keynote address from former Secretary of Energy, Dr. Ernest Moniz. And then we'll do a fireside chat with three uh, truly extraordinary panelists. Uh, Arshad Mansour, who is the incoming CEO of EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institute. Mayor Ron Nirenberg of San Antonio, uh, which is the seventh largest city in the United States and the award-winning CEO of CPS Energy, Paula Gold-Williams. And as Christine has mentioned, Paula chairs uh, the Keystone Policy Center's board. And so she is near and dear to the hearts of uh, the entire Keystone community. And so many of the folks uh, tuning in um, for this uh, discussion. Now, uh, 2020 has been a horrific year in many ways. Uh, but as you can see, Keystone intends to end 2020 on a very high note with this final uh, key conversation for the year. We also have a record number of RSVPs. And um, so we are going to get started right now with a quick introduction of uh, Secretary Moniz, uh, who is one of the true uh, wise men in the energy world. Secretary Moniz uh, served from 2013 to 2017 as the Secretary of Energy under President Barack Obama. He is a nuclear physicist and former professor of physics and engineering at MIT. Secretary Moniz is the chairman 
and CEO of the Nuclear Threat Initiative. He also is the CEO and co-founder of the Energy Futures Initiative. Prior to that, Secretary Moniz was a director of the Energy Initiative at MIT, and he still serves as a uh, special advisor to the president of MIT. In addition to um, uh, Secretary Moniz, uh, extraordinary public service. Um, he has received nine honorary doctorates and an astonishing number of distinguished medals and awards. Dr. Moniz represents a rare combination of brilliance, pragmatism, and decades of experience adapting public policy to science. So Mr. Secretary, we're gonna let you get underway. We'll need you to just unmute, sir. Uh, that helps, yes. Uh, and uh, thanks for the introduction, uh, Clint. Uh, I know you've, you're from the uh, culture that uh, makes um, wisdom and age proportional. So I know how to take your, uh, your, uh, your compliment uh, there. <laughs> uh, uh, today, um, uh, I think we probably all agree that any residual uncertainty uh, about having a new, a new president on January 20th uh, is uh, fully relieved. Um, and uh, I, so I think focusing on President-elect Biden's uh, uh, commitment to climate is, is really an important one uh, to, to have uh, today up to the inauguration day and of course uh, in, the years, in the years to follow. Uh, I would say that uh, you know one one of the one of the statements of of, of the president elect uh, to focus on was of course the uh, announcement that he would have John Kerry filling a new role as a climate envoy uh, with a seat at, at the National Security Council. I mean, sending an unmistakable message uh, that the United States uh, will not only uh, rejoin the Paris Agreement, you know, on 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 January twentieth, um, but also has every intention of, of really working hard uh, to, re to regain the global leadership role uh, on climate change uh, 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 as, as an imperative for the environment, uh, for the economy, for security um, uh, going forward. However, it's also the case that while uh, reestablishing the global leadership, uh, uh, rejoining the community of nations uh, in this effort, uh, is, is, is critically important. The reality is, uh, at least in my view, that success can only come uh, by uh, not just rebuilding, but rebuilding and greatly expanding our domestic program. Uh, we have to walk the talk uh, if we are going to uh, be able to accomplish uh, the kinds of goals that, uh, that the president-elect has, uh, has put forward. Now, I think one of the very important words to focus on right off the right, right at the beginning is regional. Uh, that is, we are going to need um, a, a new approach, frankly, uh, in which I, I think the Biden administration kind of weaves together what will be very, very different regional approaches uh, domestically uh, to reach uh, what is increasingly uh, focused on uh, as the, the net zero uh, emissions goal economy-wide uh, by, uh, by mid-century. Uh, I think it's worth <laughs> a little focus on that uh, regional uh, variation because uh, uh, I think it not only tells us how hard it's going to be, uh, but also how we need to think about uh, the solutions in a, in a different way. At EFI, the Energy Futures Initiative that you mentioned, in fact, we've done some and we'll do more specifically uh, regionally focused uh, studies. And I think it's worth putting this in, into focus by talking about a couple of those. Uh, a, the most recent one was on New England, uh, where I am sitting today. I'm here in, 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 in Boston. Uh, and you know what? It's cold. It reminds me, we are in northern part of the United States. Uh, we also have very little heavy industry. Uh, we also have unimpressive uh, onshore uh, renewable resources. And so you think about what do you do? 
to decarbonize in a region uh, like this? Well, number one, you realize that almost 90% of the emissions uh, are transportation, heating of buildings, uh, uh, which has quite a bit of seasonal variation uh, and uh, electricity generation. Uh, so not surprising, you know, what is a core solution? It's basically electrifying huge parts of the transportation and of the heating uh, agenda, uh, leading to a projection of nearly doubling electricity demand from now to 2050, and finding that to satisfy that, we're talking two thirds renewables. And in there, we're talking 22,000 megawatts of offshore wind. You know, you, you, especially if you are not going to be doing nuclear, if you, are, if you don't have the capacity, the geological capacity for carbon capture and sequestration, you know, you pretty rapidly, it focuses the mind on what are the options uh, that, are, that are possible. So uh, a few comments on that, however, important. One is while we do see that we can have a lot of renewables because of the offshore resource uh, uh, in, in, in the Northeast, it does not change the fact that we will need significant amounts of firm clean generation uh, to complement uh, that uh, in, in a reliable system. It means we're going to need, in the absence of CCS, in the absence of nuclear, it means we're going to need much more additional transmission capacity to bring in Quebec Hydra. It means we're going to have to have the infrastructure for 2,000 massive offshore wind turbines and an undersea transmission infrastructure. It means we're going to have to have the uh, natural gas capacity sustained because we do have something called polar vortex days uh, for at which time uh, the solution of, uh, uh, of, of heating through electricity is not gonna be up to the task uh, to be perfectly honest. Um, we're going to need uh, all of the onshore servicing industries for that offshore activity. This is a region, however, in which natural gas pipelines, transmission lines, nuclear power, the now defunct Cape Wind project have come and gone. This is, this is the reality that I wanna emphasize. We have got plenty of innovation resource, long duration storage, we can, we can work on that and do it. But we have enormous infrastructure challenges to maintain a reliable system with enough optionality and flexibility, yet this is a long pole in the tent for which the history says, we gotta work very, very hard and soon, this includes the Biden administration, uh, in order to overcome these obstacles. Now, if you look at other parts of the country, you have additional challenges. Uh, uh, we've done a study in California uh, where there is substantially more uh, industrial con uh, contribution, for example, and very, very good renewable resources. Very, very good, except when you look fine grain. So there's wind, lots of solar. But what people don't talk about is too much is look at the data. The data are that 90 days out of the year in California, there's no wind. And there's no wind for as much as 10 days in a row. It fluctuates year by year a little bit. People don't talk about the seasonality, the fact that solar is double, solar insulation is double in the summer than in the winter. So there's lots and lots of system challenges that have to be brought together. And unfortunately, we saw in August of this year already how the system was not designed to handle the amount of solar penetration up to now, about 16, 17% on the way to a much higher number without addressing the reliability issues, not on the good days, 
but on the bad days. Uh, and so in August, what we found is an enormous heat wave covering the West uh, and the loss of firm capacity over these last years, unfortunately led to what we saw in terms of the rolling blackouts. Industry, California has got an enormous carbon capture and sequestration potential. Uh, and we had a report on that just recently, went into great detail. But today there are no projects actually going on in California, uh, even though that would be the only really viable way today to address cement plant emissions, for example, uh, uh, ethanol plant emissions, uh, refinery uh, emissions. And why? Well, again, a big part of this is the dialogue with the public for what it takes to develop the infrastructures, as I described a few minutes ago in, in New England. So for example, if you look at the state policies, what you find is that on the one hand, there's a low carbon fuel standard, which today would put a whole bunch of industrial projects in the money uh, with, for CCS with those incentives. But on the other hand, the main comprehensive law governing uh, uh, climate change mitigation, uh, SB 100, says that CCS is explicitly not allowed to meet the low carbon objectives. So it's on the one hand and on the other hand. So these are the kinds of things we can fix. Uh, we've got to get things aligned, have a system view, but it's not talked about enough. This is a hard job that we have to start right now in this decade to get these regional solutions aligned, technology, policy, regulation, uh, public acceptance, uh, and the like. And since uh, we have some colleagues here from Texas, I'll just mention that if you look at Texas, we have not yet done a, uh, an in-depth study, but uh, Texas, wind capital of the United States, well, the bad news is when you look fine grained, it's just like California. Nine days in a row, no wind uh, in the state. So you can, you can do that while wind is where it is now. But as you grow that, you have to look at the system view, how you have the firm power uh, in there uh, to, uh, uh, to be reliable under, especially under extreme uh, uh, conditions. And Texas, uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to lecture our Texans. Uh, Texans know about some of the extreme weather uh, situations that that can uh, that can develop. I'll also mention in Texas, however, again, in terms of needing a to stand back and take a a bigger view, is it's clear electrification, uh, uh, just like in New England, just like in California, electrification uh, and a substantial growth. Uh, in, in, in electricity load is certainly going to be part of the solution. But I'd like to note also that, of course, Texas uh, has an, an, ex an extraordinary uh, oil and gas uh, uh, industry and, and, and infrastructure that is certainly going to be challenged uh, in a low carbon transition. What, what can they do to be part of the solution and prosper? Well, you know, carbon capture and sequestration carbon dioxide removal, hydrogen, low carbon liquid fuels, engineered geothermal. Every one of these areas are areas that call upon the capacity, the physical capacity and assets, the workforce assets that serve the current oil and gas industry. So the right kind of uh, political, policy uh, incentives uh, together with the industries looking at how they evolve in a low carbon world in a place like Texas with early mover possibilities with various hubs for these kinds of activities I just mentioned could be a game changer for Texas uh, and uh, a model uh, much more broadly. So I really wanted to spend a, a fair amount of time on this idea that these regional focus areas is going to be, it's critical work. It's not always 
the work that we talk about all the time uh, in terms of new, new technologies, uh, it reflects that. Uh, but I think this is a major challenge for the next administration to work with the states and the cities to put this kind of a solution uh, into place. Now, uh, um, and, and of course, optionality and flexibility associated with innovation uh, uh, clearly is, is very important here. So let me, uh, let me uh, uh, kind of conclude by being a little bit more explicit in what I believe are some of the next administration's uh, needed, needed approaches besides this regional uh, solution. First of all, I think it's very clear uh, that especially following the experience of these last four years, uh, that administration uh, has to come in with a substantial uh, package of executive actions uh, very, very early on. Uh, that will obviously include uh, uh, rolling back some of the last year's rollbacks, <laughs> like on, uh, on methane emissions, uh, on uh, where I think uh, we need to really come down uh, uh, hard. We, we means including the industry, uh, of course. Uh, we need to, you know, to uh, restart the DOE energy efficiency standards approach. Uh, we need to get CAFE standards uh, put, uh, put back in place. Uh, we could go on. Uh, we need to, I believe, uh, and I believe this will happen, uh, we need to go back to using the social cost of carbon uh, as part of the cost benefit analysis of every standard and uh, regulatory uh, proceeding. But we also have to go out into new areas, which again, I believe the Biden administration will, such as having all of the financial regulatory agencies really incorporate corporate climate risk management and, 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 uh, and disclosures as central to everything they do, building on the, on the CFTC report uh, that came out uh, not, uh, not so long ago. But besides the, uh, a whole package of executive actions uh, I think there are two areas uh, where we will see work with Congress uh, uh, in a bipartisan way. One will be to extend the uh, bipartisanship that's been shown uh, in Congress in the last few years on advancing the innovation agenda. This is very important. However, we have to put this on steroids. If we are going to have any chance of meeting the 2035 and 2050 goals, uh, that uh, the president-elect has put forward, it's got to be based upon an enormous supercharged decade of innovation starting now. Uh, that's the only way we will have the new tools ready for scaling by, say, 2030 uh, in order to meet the deployment goals uh, subsequently. Uh, another area is clearly infrastructure. I just don't believe that uh, the can will get kicked down the road again. Somehow or another, Congress will, in a bipartisan way, find money uh, to do infrastructure. And that will have to include a lot of energy infrastructure, uh, uh, grids, carbon dioxide management, uh, electric vehicle charging, uh, hydrogen infrastructure. There are so many needs, which again, given a kickstart early, uh, would really help deployment uh, uh, as we come to need it at scale uh, in, say, the next, uh, the next 10 years. It also will be a great job creator because, for one thing, we have found that in the five years pre-COVID, the energy sector drove job creation at double the rate of the economy as a whole. So this is a great area uh, to invest in uh, and have that leverage on job creation uh, as well. Finally, I just say that clearly to getting, getting comprehensive climate legislation is, is a much bigger hill to climb. Uh, and certainly uh, the possibilities will depend uh, very strongly on what happens in Georgia uh, on January the 5th with the, uh, the special election for the two senators. Uh, because of course the majority uh, leader in the Senate, uh, no matter how slim uh, the majority, uh, uh, controls the agenda. 
uh, uh, the, the, the hearings, the, the committee chairs, the hearings, uh, uh, the what, what comes to a vote uh, is, uh, is, is controlled in that way. So that'll be very important. I do think that there will be more motion towards climate legislation. A lot of interest, for example, in many draft bills around on things like clean energy standards, uh, getting to carbon pricing, bigger, bigger, uh, bigger uh, hill to climb. Um, uh, uh, although even there, I think traction is developing uh, that can that can move forward over these years. But I would say is quick out of the box, executive actions, innovation agenda, infrastructure agenda, and start to provide the foundations of broader climate policy uh, is something that we can see early on uh, in the next administration. At least I'm hoping for that. Uh, and, uh, and Clint, with that, I turn it back to you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. That was uh, perfect. And you've kept us on schedule. We've got about five or six minutes to take questions for Secretary Moniz. Please um, use the Q&A feature and not the chat room. Although, um, and I will just start with a quick question, um, uh, Secretary Moniz. The, um, when you look at a bipartisan approach to Congress, I saw that yesterday the Senate and uh, House in a bipartisan way has begun moving on um, a energy technology package as you were hoping for. Did, did you have a chance to review that? And can you comment on it? Uh, I haven't had a chance to to review what just happened, uh, but uh, but clearly uh, a lot of the pieces have been around for quite a while. The innovate, the innovate uh, uh, America, etc. Uh, so uh, uh, I think first of all, I am encouraged, uh, as you say, that there does seem to be a lot of bipartisan uh, support uh, uh, to to uh, move it with the omnibus bill. Uh, we always know that's always a a tough lift politically uh, in the end game. Uh, so I am guardedly optimistic, uh, shall we say. Uh, but I think uh, that, uh, uh, I, I think we need, we need still a, uh, to focus on the issue of getting a lot of those pieces. Uh, and for example, I'll mention one piece where we at EFI have been very, very active uh, um, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, analysis and reports, but also very active uh, at the request of Congress uh, in helping shape the agenda is the enormous carbon dioxide removal agenda, uh, where again, we've, we have found tremendous bipartisan support. Uh, we will see it expanded if the, if the uh, energy uh, innovation piece uh, is, is there. Uh, but to give a scale, uh, what we've said uh, after analysis and bottom up, uh, bottom up construction is that the carbon dioxide removal agenda for the federal government calls for nearly $11 billion over the next 10 years. Uh, now, by some measures, that's not a lot uh, given, um, given the importance uh, for net zero and eventually net negative uh, uh, emissions. On the other hand, when you're trying to find a billion a year out of the out of the appropriations budget uh, with uh, uh, with with budget ceilings, it's not so easy. So I think we're going to need also creative financing mechanisms, uh, a mixture of appropriations and other kinds of budgetary constructs, uh, in order to move not just the CDR but the entire innovation agenda, which probably needs at least five to ten times uh, that billion dollar a year. Um, uh, in this decade. And uh, Secretary Moniz, we have a question from uh, Kathleen Barone asking if you can quickly describe some of the uh, potential advances in nuclear uh, technology uh, that might, might be included in a forward-looking package. Uh, and I'm sure it will be included in the forward, and there's a lot of interest in Congress. Uh, uh, first statement, uh, flat out, uh, there has never been so much innovation uh, in, uh, in new nuclear as there is today. Uh, and that is in both fission and fusion. Um, the latter might be a little bit more surprising uh, than the former, uh, but uh, fission and fusion, 
with a tremendous amount of private capital uh, actually advancing that innovation. Uh, in fact, let me just first say on fusion, where people are often less familiar, there are several companies just in the United States and, and a few others uh, around the world that are applying novel technologies to fusion, much more compact uh, devices uh, that are looking very, very promising and interesting. And of course, that would be a huge game changer uh, if that could uh, come to pass. In the United States, uh, I would say we've had the order of a billion dollars of private capital invested in fusion. Uh, and soon we're reaching the point where I think private public partnership uh, will be essential uh, for, for demonstration. In fission, uh, uh, there are a number of gen generation four uh, reactors uh, uh, and, and a whole set of uh, uh, modular, uh, small modular reactors uh, that are looking very, very interesting, uh, by the way, including light water in the latter case, but also uh, molten salt and, uh, and uh, high temperature gas, uh, other kinds of reactors. Uh, we need to get these, we're at the stage where uh, we again need to get some of these out there and demonstrated. Um, uh, we need to demonstrate the techno-economic performance. Um, uh, this could be again, a game changer in the United States and around the world. I cannot say how much interest there is in these technologies where typically we're talking about 50 to 200 megawatts uh, scale for an individual reactor, uh, huge amounts of, of interest. Uh, we have a couple of them well advanced in the NRC licensing process. Now we gotta get over the valley of death uh, and, and, get, and get these things um, uh, demonstrated. I think, again, the federal government, through its enormous procurement possibilities, can exercise a great pull uh, to, um, uh, to, to succeed. I would, I'm just going to add one more thing, uh, Clint, on this, because we don't talk about it as much. And it may, it may be that the applications are more in other places, but uh, there has been also very interesting development in micro reactors, uh, let's say typically in the one to 10 megawatt range. So a, a few megawatts, clearly uh, these could serve remote, uh, remote places. Uh, you know, this is, it's a scale that's more manageable. Uh, uh, many of them, uh, they don't require any refueling uh, when they run out of fuel. Uh, after quite a few years, they've simply replaced. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's the, the operability is, is, is better, but also not just rural communities, but rural industrial applications. Uh, for example, Canada, let's say, is very interested in these to run remote mining operations uh, where the carbon intensity uh, today is very, very high. Uh, and to replace that with something like, like a micro reactor. So I'll just go back to my initial statement. We have never seen the kind of level of innovation uh, that we are seeing today in nuclear. But again, we need, uh, I think, to need, need the, with, with private capital, but still we need the public policy uh, to get these, uh, I think, over the hump uh, and, and demonstrated to be ready to scale in the 2030 and beyond time period. And Mr. Secretary, we have uh, 18 questions and we've run over our time limit. So I'm going to ask you one last question from the audience and then suggest to Christine that we better invite you back next year since we have uh, so many questions. Uh, great questions all. Uh, Diego Mendoza asks, what kind of potential does hydrogen have as it relates to utility scale energy storage? Oh, I think uh, huge. In fact, in our California report, while not predicting that it would be hydrogen, we put forward hydrogen uh, as, uh, as the uh, kind of the existence proof of being able to handle uh, the seasonal storage uh, questions. Uh, uh, however, I do want to uh, distinguish that from hydrogen as a direct 
combustion fuel in, in, in electricity generation. Uh, it, very, it very well may do that. And we're seeing a lot of motion in this direction. Uh, new, the new turbines, uh, for example, typically now would, uh, are able to handle, say, 30% hydrogen uh, in, the, in, the, in the mix uh, for, for combustion with the idea that they could go to 100%. But what I want to emphasize more is that hydrogen is, uh, can be like the natural gas of the future uh, in the sense of uh, the energy source, technically the energy carrier, uh, that serves multiple end uses. Uh, we often forget that, that that critical feature of natural gas is the way it can do so many things. Uh, of course, directly heating homes, uh, uh, providing electricity, uh, providing industrial feedstocks, uh, 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 all of that, P providing very high temperature process heat for industry, uh, and, and hydrogen uh, could be kind of the natural successor to that, including potentially uh, natural gas playing a significant role, uh, at least for some time, in providing what's called blue hydrogen, uh, namely uh, steam reforming of gas as is done today for hydrogen, but combined with carbon capture and sequestration of, of the CO2 uh, emitted, uh, as is being done uh, in Texas today uh, with, with at least one, one plant. So uh, I think hydrogen uh, uh, has just, can, I mean, there could be other solutions uh, combining renewable natural gas and uh, breakthroughs in low carbon liquid fuels, et cetera. But right now, I'd say hydrogen provides the standard uh, for potentially resolving multiple issues in multiple sectors. But once again, I don't think we have in any way settled in on what is the right infrastructure for all of the storage and transportation and utilization of, of, uh, of hydrogen. Uh, some think it's definitely pipes. Some think it's definitely some organic liquid, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, it may very well be that this will be another example of regional solutions that look, that look, uh, that look different. Um, uh, we are advocating uh, that there should be a smart move out uh, right now in this decade in, in building up at least important hydrogen hubs uh, that, that force us to begin answering these questions of, of where we are going with the associated infrastructure. Thank you so much, Secretary Moniz. And uh, we have so many additional great questions that I will ask Paula and Christine to make sure that we get you back next year in a follow-up. It was really a great presentation. And on behalf of our audience, I'm gonna uh, give you an ovation. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, thanks, Clint, and uh, and uh, thanks to all my good colleagues on the next panel as well. <laughs> Thank you, Ernie. Take care. Okay. Bye. 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 Now we're going to transition to our fireside chat, uh, starting with Arshad Mansoor, um, who is the incoming president of the Electric Power Research Institute, fondly referred to as EPRI. Arshad is responsible for EPRI's operation and R&D portfolio, including demonstration programs. EPRI's scope spans all sources of generation, uh, power delivery and utilization, and environmental issues. In his prior roles at EPRI, Arshad had direct oversight over every single one of these subjects, um, and he has a PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Texas. So he's in good company with our Texas panelists. He also holds five patents in distributed energy resources. Arshad will begin with an overview of EPRI's analysis and research for realistic pathway toward meaningful decarbonization. So Arshad, we'll begin with you. Thank you, thank you, Clint. It's an absolute honor and pleasure to be here. It's a hard act to follow after Secretary Moniz. Uh, we had the honor and pleasure for many, many years to hear the wisdom from uh, Secretary Moniz when he was part of our advisory council and board. 
So what I'm going to do is in the next few minutes, take a few, maybe put some granularity on the opportunity to get to net zero, but what are the challenges? And uh, this is enlightened by our research that we have done over decades and trying to put some numbers behind what does it make to go to a net zero future? How can it be affordable and reliable? And how do we make sure this transition is equitable to the parts of the societies that are underserved? And what we started was thinking about, well, what have we done in the past? And how, when, how can we accelerate in the future in our clean energy transition? So a little bit about the past, US focused. In 2005, the emission energy production, transportation use related emission in US was six gigaton per year. So keep that number six in your mind. We use 2005 because 2005 is often used as a baseline year and that's the Paris uh, Climate Treaty. That six gigaton came from electric sector, the way we produce electricity. It came from transportation sector, the way we do mobility. And it came from industries and buildings using direct fossil fuel for heating our home and for industrial processes. The largest emission was from the electric sector, almost 40%. And then you had the transportation sector around 33% and 27% was buildings and industry. So now put your head on net zero. Net zero means we got to take this six that we were in 2005 and get to zero. So if you look at 2020 before the pandemic, so 15 years time frame, our emission prior to the pandemic, January 2020 was five gigaton. So we were able to get from six to five, it took us 15 years. Clearly we have to accelerate because if it takes us 15 years to take one gigaton out, it'll take us a long, long time to get to zero. But the way we did that was predominantly on the electric sector. So if you look at the electric sector it became almost 30% clean and how did that happen? Two third of that happened from coal to gas conversion and one third of it happened wind and solar. But we also added another tool in our toolbox that we have been using for a long time and that's energy efficiency. Our country as a whole in the last 15 years became almost 20% more efficient in the amount of primary energy that is needed for one unit of GDP. And this efficiency plays a huge role in this transition and be equitable in this transition because utilities in US spend $6 billion a year on energy efficiency programs. Many of them target the underserved community. And it's a energy efficiency. We always remain a tool in our toolbox. Cleaning the electric grid, we need to continue to clean. But now let's look at 2030 or 2035. And from five, can we go to three? Can we take two gigaton out in 15 years, not one gigaton? And to do that, that's where our research enlightens uh, that I'm gonna talk about maybe four key things that we'll have to do in the near term. Near term is 10 to 15 years. First, a lot of questions on nuclear. That's the largest carbon free source of energy in the US. We need to make sure we're able to continue to operate them reliably, affordably because we don't wanna lose the largest carbon free source of electricity in US. Because if we do, the transition will not be affordable. Second, we have to reimagine the grid. All our analysis and everybody else's analysis shows we will have significantly more wind and solar, 3X, 4X times. To handle this additional variable generation, to operate reliably, a grid modernization, reimagining the grid, reimagining markets, reimagining the value of capacity and energy. All those things we need to do now. We're doing grid modernization for decade, but as uh, Secretary Moniz said, we need to supercharge grid modernization. We need to bring in a new tool in our toolbox, which actually is the most exciting thing in this next decade, which is gonna start in a couple of weeks. The new tool in the toolbox is how do we get the transportation sector to participate in this journey of reducing emission? And we now have an opportunity for electrifying transportation, especially passenger cars. And that would have significant benefit for 
an average U.S. household earns $45,000. Roughly 10% of that $45,000, $4,500 goes to their energy bill. Gasoline, electricity, natural gas. When electric vehicle reaches first cost parity, today it hasn't reached first cost parity. And that household can afford an electric vehicle. They will be able to reduce their emission, household emission by two thirds, but more importantly, reduce their energy bill by $1,000 out of 4,500. The electric bill will go up. Overall energy bill, $1,000 down. We never had a clean energy opportunity where you reduce your emission and you impact your pocketbook and your energy bill actually goes down. But it's not just going to happen because car manufacturers and companies will produce cars, electric vehicles that are affordable. We have to make sure charging infrastructure is available to all, not just the few, not just the privileged, but it's available to all. And we need to take a moonshot. We need to take a uh, what we did in 1930s, rural electrification. Electricity is going to the end of the grid, to all customers. We need to make sure charging infrastructure is there for all customers. If we continue to do these things, we have an opportunity to get to four, three, 50 percent reduction by 2035. And I'm going to end up with what Secretary Muniz mentioned several times. But how do you get from three to zero? You can't electrify a cement industry. You cannot electrify airlines. You cannot electrify shipping industry. It is hard to electrify heating in very cold climate. And this is where the concept comes in of indirect electrification, which is use the clean electricity from nuclear, wind, solar, CCS, and create another clean form of molecule. It could be hydrogen. It could be liquid ammonia. It could be synthetic methane. And that's the innovation moonshot that we need to undertake in this country and at EPRI we already have. Uh, this is the year we launched a five-year initiative. It's gonna be a billion dollar initiative, low carbon resource initiative with the focus on advancing these technologies at scale and affordable in the next 10 years. Hydrogen today produced in a clean way cost $40 per million BTU. Natural gas costs $3 a million BTU. Clearly, you're not going to have the transition affordable unless you can significantly reduce the cost of hydrogen. And that's really the innovation challenge that we have in this decade. So with that, I'm going to pause. Uh, it's hard to follow Secretary Moniz, but it's hard to come before our uh, board member, Paula Gore-Williams and the mayor. So uh, I'm going to hand it back to you, uh, Lynn. You've done a great job of, um, of um carrying everyone's interest, uh, Arshad. And um, what I'm gonna do is um, hold our questions until we um, get through with initial discussions from each of the panelists and um, then come in with questions. You know, members of the audience, if you do have questions, um, please uh, put them into the Q&A uh, mechanism, not the chat room, and I will uh, start at question 18. So if there was a question that you had of uh, Secretary Moniz that you would like to reframe, uh, please feel free to do that. And um, we'll make sure we have a little bit more time um, to have an interactive discussion with the audience. Um, we're extremely fortunate um, to have Mayor Ron Nuremberg with us today. Uh, San Antonio, as I mentioned, is the seventh largest city in the United States and one of the fastest growing. Mayor Nuremberg is serving his second term as mayor with an extraordinarily high uh, approval rating, notwithstanding all of the challenges uh, that have uh, hit his city and so many cities and communities across the country and across the world. The uh, prior to uh, serving as mayor, um, Ron Nuremberg also served two terms on the city council. And he has championed um, a subject near and dear to my heart and Paula's smart city and regional planning, inclusive economic development, environmental stewardship, another subject near and dear to our hearts, and governmental accountability. Also, uh, Mayor Nuremberg's personal bio 
reveals that he is the son of an immigrant from Southeast Asia and the grandson of immigrants from Eastern Europe who passed through uh, Ellis Island. And as a uh, fellow son of an immigrant uh, who passed through Ellis Island, um, we welcome you today, Mayor Nuremberg. And I, um, I just wanna quickly mention the three C's of 2020 as we see them that you have been facing. They are COVID, climate, cyber, and crisis in terms of economic disruption and social unrest. What I'd like to do is invite you to comment on what your approaches have been, um, not just with respect to uh, climate, but also social equity and the other issues uh, that you've heard today. Great, thank you very much, Clinton. And I'm excited to, to join uh, such an esteemed panel. Uh, and I appreciate the inv invitation uh, and an opportunity to talk about the innovation that's happening here in San Antonio. And in many ways, listening to Arshad give the perspective of the industry and uh, listening to Secretary Moniz, who has spent time in San Antonio, uh, I would consider San Antonio to be an exemplar in some of the things that he's talking about. And, and certainly we'll hear that uh, a little bit more in depth from, from Paula here shortly. But uh, let me just set the stage for a local policy perspective by saying that in 2017, uh, one of my first acts as mayor, uh, which was supported by my colleagues on the city council, was to commit San Antonio to the goals outlined in the Paris Climate Agreement, agreeing to help to limit the global temperature increase to one and a half degrees Celsius in this century. In doing so, we set the stage for the development of a climate action and adaptation plan that sets the bold goal of making San Antonio carbon neutral by 2050 so that we can take responsibility for our share of this global concern. Our climate plan, which is now ratified by the city council is guided by three questions. The first being, how can we reduce San Antonio's GHG emissions to align with keeping global temperatures to one and a half degrees Celsius? Two, how do we prepare San Antonio for the projected impacts of climate change, which even in San Antonio are significant? And three, how do we ensure that our response is just and equitable for all? Uh, and in San Antonio, where we have historically struggle, struggled with socioeconomic inequities, uh, that particular question is grounding all of our work. Our climate strategies are therefore divided into actions meant to reduce or prevent emissions from greenhouse gases and actions that will help limit uh, the negative impacts of climate change. The goal towards climate neutra neutrality uh, in South Texas, I will say is grand. And we have already made some significant advances in energy efficiency and shifting toward carbon free sources. Just for an example, We've had a 10% reduction in GHG emissions from 2014 to 2016, despite significant population and economic growth that you just heard about. We recently adopted PACE, a property assessed clean energy, which allows building owners to make energy efficient upgrades and with favorable financing terms. And that's critically important uh, because we are experiencing, even despite this pandemic, a, a building boom. Forming, uh, we also formed our climate equity and technical uh, and community advisory committees recently to empower our residents to have a voice in our climate conversation. And finally, I'll note that I launched a mayor's climate, excuse me, mayor's youth engagement council for climate initiatives uh, to get the best and brightest students, student minds involved in issues that they're living uh, and studying in school uh, and also to help champion and, and continue the cause for which they are, are leading the world. Our climate ready plan in San Antonio calls for the city to build on climate achievements to ensure that we reach our goal of climate neutrality and we plan on doing just that. But we have to acknowledge that we're at the intersection as you said, Clint, of some significant disruptions, both in terms of our climate emergency and a global pandemic. This doesn't mean that we have the luxury of pausing our work. Rather, it presents an opportunity to align strategies for a more comprehensive recovery. 
Therefore, recovery to our current challenges needs to be a green recovery that ensures that investments made today are not contrary to the objectives of a climate ready San Antonio, but accelerate the required action needed to ensure that San Antonio does its part to mitigate climate change and prepare our community, specifically the most vulnerable among us, to current and future impacts. Cities can take steps toward improving building and transportation efficiency, for instance, along with other actions that have co-benefits in addition to reducing greenhouse gases. Those are inclusive of air quality improvements, public health improvements, mobility option improvements, increasing economic competitiveness, and in the face of COVID-19, a green and equitable recovery. Um, I'm excited that uh, Paula is here, who has been a, a leader, not just in San Antonio, but across our country. Uh, and in a moment, you'll have a, a chance to hear more of what CPS Energy specifically is doing. But we are proud uh, to have a partner in CPS Energy, which is the largest municipally owned energy utility in the nation, to further advance our renewables portfolio while promoting new ways to conserve energy. The key part about this is that regardless of what city you're in from here to Copenhagen, the energy utility uh, in your community has a huge impact on whether or not we achieve our overall climate goals. And at the helm of our work is Paula Gold Williams, who happens to be the only African-American female CEO of an energy utility in the nation. And we're especially proud of her as she was born and raised in San Antonio. Due to the smart investments and leadership of CPS Energy in the recent history, San Antonio was recognized this year as the number five city in the nation and the first in Texas for locally installed solar photovoltaic capacity. And through our Save, to, Save for Tomorrow Energy Plan, which has been underway since roughly 2010, CPS Energy has also helped us avoid building a new fossil fuel plant by saving 845 megawatts of electricity demand ahead of schedule and under budget, something that Arshad says is, is probably not accounted for in our overall climate strategies, is that way that we can reduce demand. And we are doing that every single day. I, I do that when I walk by my thermostats in the morning that were installed by CPS Energy. Following two years of work and adoption of our climate plan, Climate change has become a major priority, obviously, and a point of discussion in our community. This, be, this is because there are multiple pressures now that are uh, becoming all the more realistic and weighty for us and challenges that San Antonio needs to overcome if we're gonna reach carbon neutrality. Since COVID-19 hit, climate change has clearly, uh, we have to be honest with each other, has not been a priority on the minds of uh, officials. However, we have to continue to move forward in the discussion of combating climate change. We have to make it a priority, not only to the, avoid the worst of this global climate emergency, but as a means of addressing longstanding inequities in our city. In the short term, that means we're focused on reducing emissions generated from the building, energy, and transportation sectors. We're also looking at ways to advance mobility options from transit to electric vehicles to simply encouraging folks to carpool. And of course, in a COVID era uh, for quite some time, we, we will see a shifting of the mobility um, patterns in our community simply because of um, uh, work from home and other telecommuting opportunities. How we build a city uh, in terms of those uh, opportunities also will have a huge effect on the outlying years of our climate strategies. So to help reduce electricity demand, we're also looking at ways we can reduce the urban heat island effect, mitigation strategies through innovation, innovations such as white roofs and piloting reflective pavement. And then let me touch on uh, the obvious for Texas, which is one of the few growing states in our urban communities are leaving, leading the charge. And it, you only look, have to look at our I-35 corridor to understand what an important element uh, this next part is, and that is population growth. As one of the fastest growing cities in the nation and the fastest growing corridor in the nation, uh, we face a particular challenge of reducing emissions alongside the projected increase in population. San Antonio's population is expected to nearly double by 2040, 
and there will be an associated increase in demand for resources. It will also mean there will be more stress on our infrastructure as well as meeting the needs of the most vulnerable residents who will experience the brunt of those climate change impacts. As a result, it's not enough to see our per capita emissions be reduced. We also need to focus on actions that will provide quicker and deeper reductions and actions that will improve the social and environmental well-being of the most marginalized members of our community. I was thrilled, for instance, uh, just now to hear Secretary Moniz uh, mention social costs. I think that is being factored into uh, the work that we're doing here in San Antonio as we are one of the first, maybe the only, uh, but certainly one of the first to have a climate action and adaptation plan, not only mention equity, but be grounded by it in the first elements uh, and first pages of our plan. Everything that emanates from that is built on equity to ensure that we have uh, a climate uh, strategy that is uh, resilient and touches every corner of our community and benefits everyone. So again, very glad to be here. Look forward to the discussion. I'm honored to be joined by uh, such an esteemed panel. Thank you, Quinn. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, I'm so happy that San Antonio is looking at smart surfaces like uh, asphalt and white buildings and so on. It's a, it is an under appreciated, underfunding, funded, under-recognized need uh, that could have very significant impacts uh, uh, for reducing uh, climate impacts. And the, the uh, temperature levels, particularly in less advantaged portions of urban areas, uh, are even higher than ur urban uh, averages as a whole. So what you're doing is terribly important, not just for carbon reduction, but also uh, as a social equity piece. And uh, thank you also for uh, bragging on our uh, board chair, Paula Gold Williams, who um, is, um, and I should mention that you um, serve as a member of the board as an ex officio member since uh, CPS is a municipally owned utility. And congratulations to you both. CPS is regarded as really one of the best run utilities um, in the United States. Congratulations to you and the amazing team of chiefs and other employees you have. Um, among other things, you have among the highest category of bond rating uh, in the United States. I also appreciate you complimenting Paula because I have in, in uh, preparing to introduce her, there are three pages of um, awards that she's won in the last three years, uh, three single, single uh, uh, set spaced uh, pages. So I'm just gonna highlight that uh, last year, Paula was named the um, Energy Trailblazer of the Year uh, by SNP Global Platts, one of the highest uh, and most prestigious awards in the entire energy industry, um, close to Mayor Nuremberg's heart Paula was also named Woman of the Year um, in San Antonio last year. And um, in addition to that, she received uh, the award from the Women's Council on Energy and the Environment as their champion uh, last year, um, an organization that uh, we work very closely with and feel is really one of the top um, energy organizations for women and beyond. Uh, in the United States. Um, the uh, one thing I will say, uh, in addition, you mentioned that Paula is the only female African American C utility CEO in the United States. And um, we have worked together, uh, not just with respect to climate and energy issues, but Paula and I have done a number of webinars, really uh, having candid conversations on social equity matters. So Paula, you have just uh, released an RFP for your flexible path bundle. Um, can you describe that a little bit and, and also do uh, bring into the conversation some of the ec social equity issues you are uh, interested in and advising San Antonio on? And then what I'm going to do is um, hold my follow-up questions and really go straight to uh, audience questions so that we have 
plenty of time for an interactive discussion. Okay, well, very good. Well, I can't sit, say how um, excited I am to be on this panel. Um, I consider all of you people I extremely admire. I also had the pleasure of looking at the people who joined us today and I'm just impressed and pleased that people are joining us for these tough discussions. Uh, very much, Clint, thank you, um, Dentons. We have been able to talk about energy, smart cities, and social justice issues. And all of those topics really kind of all come together, as Mayor Nuremberg says. These are important things that we have to take in totality. Uh, Secretary Muniz set the stage beautifully. Uh, his expertise in really understanding what's available on a global basis is important. We like to say here that we think globally and act locally, and you've got to pay attention to what's happening in the major trends of energy around the world. And then I am absolutely honored to be on the, on the board of EPRI, so watching Arshad come in. He has been energetic about this transition and the ability to bring investor-owned utilities, municipal utilities, and organizations from around the globe. Again, this, these are global issues. They are not they are not in isolation. San Antonio can't sit in here and think that uh, we can solve this by ourselves. This is one of those things where we have to be very much in partnership. And the last thing I'll say before I talk about um, the flexible path, Keystone. Um, well before uh, I became CEO, I got affiliated with Keystone. My predecessor, Dole Benaby, was part of the organization, and I am absolutely um, honored to work with a great CEO, Christine Scanlon, and her entire team. And the thing about Keystone is there's an energy board, and then there's the bigger board that we also sit on, but there's a focus on social issues, health issues, COVID-19, uh, food insecurity, agriculture, uh, tribal um, Native American issues, because again, this, this whole world that we live in is extremely complex. The challenge we have is we like to think that we can solve these issues in one way or another. Um, we like to say, but there is no silver bullet. Uh, we have to realize that we're sitting in the middle of a, of a climate crisis, as, as Amir said, in the middle of uh, the aspect that there's an energy crisis, there's a social justice crisis, and all of them have to be done in balance. CPS Energy has a long history of serving Texas, 160 years with the longest serving utility industry, uh, energy company in Texas, and we've been owned by the city for 78 years. We used to think about things in terms of a single path forward, a single, a single view. We were once completely all a natural gas company. Um, we learned a lesson about not being diversified and thinking narrowly about energy solutions. So now we're extremely diversified and we have the ability to merge in new solutions in a portfolio and do it in a very affordable way. We have some of the lowest non-standard non-promotional -prom rates in the state because we're constantly thinking about how to leverage everything that we do. And then we have a balanced platform of which we make solutions. So we think everything we need to do has to remain affordable as, as Arshad has said. Um, we have to make sure that there's reliability as, as Secretary Moniz focused. We have to worry about the safety of the community, the security, this grid issue that, that Dr. Moniz talked about, this grid issue of keeping, keeping the grid secure. Um, that's our responsibility, that's our accountability, but it's a real thing. And as we come up with solutions, we have to think about that. Environmental responsibility, it's one of our value pillars as well. How do you keep making progress? And we've been on our journey for 20 years. We've been in, we started with wind 20 years ago, and we very much have all of these programs. We've closed some coal units. We've, we have a huge energy efficiency and conservation plan, and the list goes on. And then this resilience, the ability to make the grid respond to challenges with renewables. But in the past, we used to say, let's go buy, you know, build a power plant, or let's go invest in uh, a solar farm. Uh, but now what we feel like we have to do is, is think about flexibility. Um, Secretary Muniz and I have had many conversations over the years to talk about optionality, flexibility, regionalism. And uh, in that, uh, as I got input from him and others across the industry, that's when I came up with the concept of the flexible path making sure that we're not stuck, making sure that we don't look for single solutions. So we created 
uh, this, this foundation to the flexible path strategy here. And I'm proud of our 3,100 employees who are passionate about how do we make this evolution along the, this, this pathway forward and how do we do it in a way that balances the challenges with technology with the benefits. And so we launched, uh, we first started with an RFI in August, and that is because COVID slowed the globe down. We would have done a whole lot more uh, things and did them differently if there was not COVID. We had to make sure that we were appealing to uh, businesses in San Antonio, businesses in Texas and the nation and the globe. So we went out and put this RFI and we got great responses, put it out in 10 languages. And we got about almost 200 responses, but now, we put out the RFP because the only way to really change technology is to put substance and funding and alignment and partnership, we believe, through finding real solutions. So now we really want to match the ability of funding with these new ideas. And we created this flex power bundle, this bundled approach to technology where we want up to 900 megawatts of solar. That will basically triple the capacity that we have now meaningfully. And the mayor very much has been supporting our efforts and, and our entire board is uh, supporting our efforts to make sure that we are looking at solar as a huge piece and driver to the solutions we have. But it has intermittency, it has challenges. And as, uh, as Secretary Muniz mentioned, uh, as much as we like to think that Texas has sun all the time, He's done basic studies for us that show there are, are huge gaps when you don't have renewables, uh, solar or wind. And, and so we know that we have to take the, the benefits of that 900 megawatts and complement it. We need from a resiliency standpoint, we need to make sure that we put in battery storage so it can respond quickly to when you lose that renewable. So we wanna add additional 50 megawatts at least of uh, battery storage. And then we want firming capacity. Again, the reliability of the system, the reliability of what we're trying to do has to be enhanced by some other technology. And I love the whole conversation about the different options and there are different options and we need to study them. We can't be solely on the full bleeding edge of that technology. We need to make sure that we're validating what we want we can do because we're trying to do all this to replace older fossil units and, and ultimately do that in a meaningful way that gets us on this goal. So the, the last thing I'll say about this all is CPS Energy is apolitical. Um, we, don't, we don't have a, a focus on, on what Democrats or Republicans or whoever wants to do things, but we do pay attention to the landscape. And I do think under this new administration, every single, uh, organization in, in the nation uh, has to really think about their own path forward. Uh, your regional location, how you serve and where you serve. And again, starting to look at the policies that now can potentially align differently under a new administration. And so we have studied that when you see alignment that can happen at the national, state and federal level, that momentum really matters. And also no one left behind. We can't pick and choose industries to leave behind. From an industrial standpoint, as much as we want to do that, uh, Secretary Muniz pointed out, um, there aren't solutions at the industrial uh, level just to walk away from certain industries. And let's not forget the people. The, every, every industry is a huge employer of people. And as beautiful as the renewable industry is and as quality jobs it has, it's, it has more passive systems and it doesn't need as many people. And so trying to make sure that every industry, oil and gas, agricultural, um, new technologies are thinking about how to evolve, creating bundles, creating value, creating um, transitional plans so that people's jobs can grow and change and their skill levels can grow. And again, we can continue to be a company, a country, that functions 24 seven, 365. And we're gonna do that by remaining flexible, by being open, by thinking about how can we update our path forward. And ultimately we will get to more ability to firm up our transition 
We've made a ton of progress today, but there's a ton more to do. And if we can partner and put all of these things together in alignment, CPS Energy and our family here, our CPS Energy team and family feels inspired by the opportunity that we have to make a difference and get to net zero emissions. Thank you so much, Paula. And um, I'm gonna withhold my questions for the time being to try to get um, more of the audience's uh, questions. We have one for uh, from Swami Nathan that is for each of the uh, panelists. And that is we in the USA have the most per capita energy consumption. What is the strategy to reduce consumption and conserve? So would you like to start Ashad and then we'll uh, call on the mayor and then Paula? Um, I think um, while we have to change our personal behavior, technology is the answer. I just give one example, 10 years ago, uh, 15 years ago, we all bought plasma TV. Those were large screen TVs. That was the first large screen TV that came in. That was 500 watt, a 42 inch plasma TV. That's five light bulbs. Technology moved. We went to LED. We went to organic OLED. And now that 42 inch TV takes 80 watts, 70 watts. And when you look at technology progressing in smart thermostat, when you look at air conditioning, furnaces getting more and more efficient. And when you look at cars getting more and more efficient, I think technology will continue to drive energy conservation. And there would be policy, the $6 billion a year that utilities spend and targets the underserved communities. There's a lot of strip heating in that underserved community, the worst form of heating that you can do, the most expensive form of what we can do. So, by no means using energy efficiency as a resource has been exhausted. We can do more, we need to do more. Technology will be the tip of the spear, but enabling policy is needed. Thank you, Arshan. Mayor Nuremberg? Yeah, I think um, in addition to that, I, I would say that one of the strategies that we've employed in San Antonio is to, to give uh, smarter tools to the consumer to be able to, to govern their own behavior. Um, a, a lot of times, um, you know, energy is, is being consumed um, just as normal course of life. Uh, but if the consumer had the ability to, to regulate their own behavior with, uh, you know, sm uh, the smart grid with, I mentioned thermostats, they would make those choices. And then of course, uh, we have to continue to shift um, our, our power generation mix uh, in a smart way. We have to ensure that the electricity that we are consuming is creating fewer emissions, uh, less emissions. So um, I think there's a multiple strong prong strategy that uh, we've got to attack on all fronts. Thank you, I guess, I guess what I would just add, I mean, it's, 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 I, I think they are very much the same things that are shot and, and Mayor Nuremberg talked about. There is this aspect of continuing to invest in energy efficiency and conservation. And I always give the example of, you know, the, the um, LED light bulb initially was a horrible product <laughs> and it was super expensive and everybody hated the illumination, but you have to keep feeding that technology so that eventually the price, we always say the price must uh, go down and the efficiency must go up. And so ultimately you're talking about it from that standpoint, but you have to keep, you have to keep investing. You have to keep going from the plasma TV to what the advancements will be. The federal government did a lot for us um, decades ago when it started creating requirements on energy efficient products, uh, refrigerators, dishwashers, washing machines and dryers, things like that. Those star energy things happened uh, all of a sudden and then the products got better and better but it also requires education and commitment and knowledge. We, let, we believe here at CPS Energy that we would prefer to continue to educate, prefer to show the differences, uh, continue to evolve and make sure that we're leveraging our investments over time so that people can keep moving with that technology and then helping it advance. We think that those are huge. And then you put them inside of this, this ability to talk about behavior. Behavior is exactly important. I think it makes no sense for someone to buy an electric vehicle because they're, con they're conscientious about um, not wanting the missions and then they're charging at the peak of day. 
there's an ownership responsibility that goes along with the, these investments in technology. And we just have to help customers keep making those connections so they can feel the benefits of lower bills and, and the ability to take positive action to get positive results. Thank you, Paula. We have a question from Christian Lopez for Arshad. Following the secretary's comments, do you have any thoughts regarding my screen just jumped. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts regarding hydrogen infrastructure? Um, I think um, what I'll say is uh, the hydrogen infrastructure look at today, go to Louisiana. And if you look at the industries that are using hydrogen, they're not produced cleanly, but almost half of them are using it through piping. And the other half are actually producing and storing locally. And if you look forward, I think that's the model. Some would be produced locally and stored. And the piping piece is really the most exciting piece of this moonshot research. I would say just uh, Google the four alphabets, L-C-R-I, that stands for Low Carbon Resource Initiative. You'll go to that pre homepage. There is some significant work that's going on, on worldwide. Can I repurpose my gas pipeline that I have today? You know, the steel pipelines that are the high pressure midstream pipeline. On the LDC side, local distribution company, the pipe that comes to my house, those pipes are now being changed to cross-link polyethylene and plastics. So these are not 100-year-old pipes. We are changing it. Can this infrastructure be the carrier of a new molecule, whether it's hydrogen or whether it's synthetic gas? That is, uh, that is the moonshot. There is a possibility. We store natural gas in big gas caverns, and we store hydrogen. Is research going on on that? And the answer is not no. Uh, there are challenges. So I'd say that is an area of research where in the US we have to speed up. Uh, we have partnered with Gas Technology Institute, GTI, and together with GTI and EPRI, uh, it's our focus on this decade, next five years, to answer some of those challenging questions. Can existing infrastructure be repurposed? for another new molecule. Thank you, Arshad. We have a question from Brendan Gibbons to Paula Gold-Williams, but I think we'll start with Paula and each of the panelists actually could address this. Ms. Gold-Williams, if you could make only one energy policy request of the incoming Biden administration on behalf of CPS Energy, what would it be? Wow, I knew Brendan uh, would ask me a great question, and it really is. You know, look, I think uh, if I if I had it, I would talk about this this alignment of federal dollars to infrastructure matched to regions, and then partnering the ability to get funding here. We need funding. We don't. I mean, I make I make a quippy comment about we don't print money. So everything that happens here comes from all the customers in, in, in across San Antonio. And we try to make money um, in the wholesale market. Some years are great, some years like this year, not so great. But what we need is we need support in the transition and we need people to understand that San Antonio is so special. The mayor talked about this. The, the belief that the mayor and the council and our board of directors have, uh, of trustees or board of trustees have in terms of what we can do and how to make transition, I think San Antonio could be the, the energy pilot capital of the world and the ability for us to take certain projects and explore them because we're already in the generation business, transmission business, and distribution business. So I think San Antonio is a great bet. Our bet is going to look different than Los Angeles. It's going to look different uh, than Boston, as Secretary Moniz mentioned but the ability for them to be able to focus on our transition because we've already set ourselves up for the progress that we've made, our commitment to even smart cities today and aligned to the policies that the mayor and the council are really working through. I think we're a perfect one. So to highlight that in alignment and to plant it right here where we can create something regionally that really works on our transition, that's what I would ask for. Thank you, Paula. 
Mayor, would you like to address that more broadly? What if you could make one yeah. <laughs> energy policy request, what would it be? Well, that uh, what Paula said, I think, is where the buck stops, uh, because, I, you know, my policy request of the Biden administration, um, myself uh, uh, and dozens, if not hundreds of other mayors already are making this request actively, which is to very affirmatively rejoin uh, the Paris Accord. Uh, but in, in saying that, it is a recognition that that becomes a federal priority. And all of the cascading decisions that Paula mentioned about resource allocation and ensuring that we are actually adding, adding fuel to a, a green recovery and creation of jobs and, and putting our infrastructure priorities uh, on that list of requests from Congress are going to be important. Um, so uh, a lot of that depends on federal cooperation. So I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic what the secretary said is true, which is we are going to see a new era of bipartisanship. I certainly think the president-elect is well suited uh, to usher that in. So um, I'm aligned with Paula. Uh, the policy decision for me is about rejoining the world. Thank you, Mayor. And we also uh, heard um, the secretary suggest that in addition to seeking bipartisan support, there'll be really a whole of government approach by the Biden administration where he will be employing all of the government agencies and some not traditionally used. Um, I know he's mentioned the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission in terms of taking account pricing and, and carbon in uh, decision making. He mentioned uh, uh, agencies like the SEC regarding uh, reporting of different corporations with respect to carbon. And he's mentioned, uh, the I'm not sure if he mentioned, but certainly the Department of Energy um, the Department of Interior, the Department of Agriculture uh, have all been mentioned for their respective uh, jurisdictions as well. Arshad, did you want to uh, address this question more broadly on behalf of EPRI or uh, citizens of the United States and the world? Well, I'm going to echo what Secretary Munich said. Let's supercharge innovation. Let's supercharge innovation so that hydrogen produced cleanly is not $40 a million BTU, but coming close to $5 to $10 a million BTU. Let's supercharge innovation so we reimagine the nuclear and you take the, takes the leadership role in the next generation modular, safer nuclear that is produced through 3D printing, powder metallurgy, and not constructed. Let's supercharge innovation so we can figure out how to use our existing infrastructure to put these new molecules. But only putting money or funding is not going to do it. We need to all unify on this grand challenge. National labs are one of the best resources we have in this country. Bring the national labs, bring organizations like EPRI, work with the industry and have a unique mission that this is the decade for the moonshot to bring these new technologies that we will have beyond 2030 so this transition can be done affordably and reliably. Thank you, Arshad. We have a question from Bill Thomas. Having installed solar panels on our roof, I know the benefits for reducing utility costs. With so many rooftops in the city, why not create additional incentives for homeowners to expand our solar grid? Let me start with uh, Paula, then the mayor. And Arshad, you might want to comment on that question as well. Uh, well, I think I think the rooftop solution uh, approach is very viable and actually necessary because the one challenge with solar is otherwise you need a tremendous amount of land to do it. Now we've been in um, the solar industry in both utility scale and dis distributed for for many years now. I mean, we started heavily in 2012. And we do have incentives for, for rebates. And what's been amazing to watch is that the, the price of solar has come down and become so affordable um, that you really have the ability to have a, a, you know, a system on more homes. But we also know, again, that, that is, there's still a barrier. If uh, at certain levels of income, it's still not affordable. And so we do believe that rooftop are solutions that everybody should have access to. So we do believe that you can use the rooftop and create a, 
a credit price uh, uh, system for a customer that doesn't even have to own the home. They could be renting the home and they can get a credit back on their bill. The system is owned by another company. We partner with them, the credit happens. Um, but I will say that not every rooftop is, is well suitable for solar. There are issues in terms of the orientation of your roof, the quality of the roof, can it handle the system? And so it's not a matter of you just can put it on every single one and you're not going to have any, any issues with it. But it doesn't, there are other things. We can do community solar. We can, we can mix it up with utility scale. We have a very robust uh, uh, rebate program and we're going to continue to do that. But it's getting to the point where the price parity it doesn't need as much incentive, but it does need a focus on smartly putting the panels in the right place to cause, uh, to create that, that synergy that we need overall. But we can't use it to solve everything, but we're gonna continue to invest in it. Thank you, Paula. Mayor? Yeah, I, I agree. And, and San Antonio was, a, was an early adopter uh, and used what I would call probably crude uh, methods at first, and we've innovated over time. And the focus has been, as Paula mentioned, making sure that all customers had an entry point. So you have to create a menu. You have to create a, a options for them uh, at different price points uh, and, and at different levels of home ownership, whether they're renters or, or homeowners. Uh, and those who may want to own their system versus those who may want to rent, uh, lease back their roof or something like that. So. We focus on those and, and the other part of it is uh, you also have to have a good relationship, I think, with the local installer and small business community, because that is, uh, if done well, also an economic development opportunity where you can create jobs that benefit uh, benefit the, an industry that, that is beginning to innovate. So uh, I think, uh, again, not to continue to brag on, on San Antonio, but that is my job. We are an exemplar in this way in terms of providing own, uh, uh, options for uh, various levels of solar adoption. You, you've earned the right to brag on San Antonio Mayor. Uh, Arshad, did you have a comment? Yes, the comment is uh, if I can produce electricity from sun at half the cost of rooftop solar by community solar, then the option as a researcher, we are always looking at what is the least cost option. So if community solar can produce a kilowatt hour of electricity at half the cost, then from a technology point of view, both are needed, but we need to make sure we are prioritizing and focusing, especially if the community solar is in an underserved community. And especially the community solar effect can be configured as a microgrid. So it is actually providing resiliency to the underserved communities. So I think we need, all options needs to be there, but we need to do the math and look at the economics. And, and Clint, may I add one other thing to this? And this is something that Paula could go on for days about, but if we are truly gonna be an equitable uh, deliverer of this solar opportunity, we also have to look out for the infrastructure necessary to create a centralized grid. Um, and, and a lot of times, that's forgotten in this equation. If people are gonna just have the option of buying their own system and completely remove themselves from their social responsibility of allowing solar for those who you know, couldn't necessarily afford their own units, then we've, then we've lost that opportunity to, to not only be an equitable deliverer, but also to really see the expansion of solar in the way that we wanna see it for, resiliency, uh, for, for resilience purposes. Thank you, Mayor. Paula, I know you support that. Do you do you want to supplement your comment? I, didn't, I never think I get an extra time to do that. I mean, um, yeah, look again, resiliency is one of the pillars and it's probably one of the hardest ones to, to talk to people about because um, it's kind of the, you know, part of the thing that we have to do overall is again, think about that to, uh, grid and security. Um, and it's, and, we, and it, we do it in the background. So customers shouldn't have to worry about it, but I will say it's a key part. I mean, again, the design that we have now, trying to, trying to get money on the infrastructure is extremely important because it's better if we can convert as much as we can, optimize part of the grid that we can, make it more functional in terms of pushing power multiple ways, isolating areas, creating an architecture where, as Arshad says, optimizing solar with energy storage 
and creating the resiliency and the intelligence of the data that can help us optimize it and really make it work. And ultimately, I do believe that the energy industry will, will convert from just the pushing the power from a single source, but optimizing multiple mini networks across a community to make them make them work. Key to that are resources like solar. And I, you know, I, I do want to agree with Arshad. What I get totally jazzed up about is there are technologies that we don't even know today that will be where we want to be. When I entered this industry 16 years ago, nobody ever thought solar was going to be viable at all. It had that same price pressure that we're talking about with hydrogen. But these are solvable solutions. All we got to do is unleash the creativity from an innovation standpoint and also tell people to focus on the grid, the resiliency. Uh, one of our trustees, trustee uh, Janie Gonzalez, is from the tech side. And she's always talking to us about how do you really think about the solutions much more comprehensively and leave your, yourself open to global and local as you're helping businesses um, and getting jobs going. So I think all of this, again, we, I never look at anything uh, in one, one alignment of thought. I look at everything, it's like a matrix, I mean, and I'm a big movie buff. It's a matrix of solution sets that we have to feed into. But interestingly, you never know where that next solution is, but you gotta keep making those improvements along the way. Thank you, Paula. We, um, we have about five or six minutes left. We have a question from Gabriel Garcia. What is the best strategy for getting corporations to adopt a clean environment agenda as they carry a significant voice with legislators and at the state and federal level? Do you want to start with that, Mayor? And we'll have Paula and then Arshad. You know, that's a, that's a great question and probably the, the, the question uh, that, um, that legislators have to deal, uh, grapple with is if we're going to be realistic about achieving our goals. I, I would say, number one, we've seen the largest companies in America, our Fortune 500 companies, uh, adopt a resilient strategy because they see that's that's where the market is. Um, so I think we have to uh, advance the uh, perspectives of our consumers who are demanding uh, a more resilient um, economy, a greener economy. Um, and I think we have to to understand that it is also going to take a little bit of a um, an aggressive approach when it comes to regulation. I mean, the advances in the automotive industry, for instance, didn't just happen, um, you know, all of a sudden, but they did require things like um, uh, mileage standards. And, and so I think there is going to be, a ha there, there, there will be a recognition that regulation plays a role. And that's where I think that uh, the Biden administration is going to find a proper balance uh, but then, I, then again, I think uh, we have to encourage um, corporations to follow the, the, cons the sentiment of their consumers. And, and clearly, if, if San Antonio is any indication, uh, we are starting to see um, the corporate uh, sector that is, is going to play a huge role uh, in our climate strategy uh, take a lead because of the, the way the market is moving. Thank you, Mayor. Paula? Look, I, I think um, what's critical is, uh, again, not dismissing one industry or another or indicating that it doesn't want to make the transition um, in, its, in its technology. When you start to think about how comprehensive this, when you, it, it, this challenge is, we need national labs. We need organizations like EPRI. We, need, we do need the alignment at the, at the policy level it's not just because people don't want to, they need help. And we need to make sure that they are included, that they are invited to the table, that they are again, incented to make um, that transition. When I say incented, I mean by inclusion. I, I, that they, I do believe that customers are expecting this and I think that is absolutely great, but it, we're not there yet. Hydrogen is not there yet. And so we have to really make sure that that journey is one that every single industry, every single company feels that it's on and that we're helpful. 
that we're sharing that technology to that our child is talking about. So that's, that's what I think is really critical. And you're a, you're a big tent bridge builder. You would like to get as a broad coalition, as many yes. people under that tent as possible. Do you want to comment on that for a moment? And then we'll let um, Arshad wrap this up for us. Well, I, definitely. I mean, look, we, we supply power to everyone and I don't know anybody that would tell you, I don't want clean air. I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't know who you are. If you don't say, I don't want beautiful clean, blink, clean air and, and blue skies. And so to, again, um, exclude people or um, not be open to their ideas and not sit there and think about helping them think through their transition is important. The utility industry has to make that transition, but we want everybody with us. Um, there are children to raise in this economy. There are people who need to convert their skills. It requires more collaboration, partnership, and again, openness. So I, I very much believe, again, that every industry has to find its way. Every industry is doing it. A lot of industries are thinking about it. But if they're private companies, they don't necessarily share their research. But I do think sharing research ultimately will be the key. And if we include everybody, then I think making it more of an open architecture view, I think we will get there much faster. Thank you, Paula. Arshad. Um, I think the last four years, the most promising and exciting thing in the US that has happened is corporations. I'm specifically talking about electric utilities, making a clear pledge and a clear commitment to net zero. BPS San Antonio, Duke Energy, Southern Company. If you look at utilities after utilities, it's in the last two years. And it's not just making a pledge for net zero, but they're walking the talk. They're reducing their emissions. So I think all corporations, ultimately they'll lead us there and policy will follow because that's the will of the society. You know, Arshad, I had a talk with Tom Kuhn, the head of Edison Electric Institute really uh, recently, where he made exactly the same point that you just made that utilities now really are walking the walk. It has not always been the case but it is certainly the case now and very impressive and doing much of this on a voluntary basis, leading on these issues rather than being forced to uh, move forward. It, it's a great development to watch. My wish for the Biden administration for the United States and beyond is that we can um, really be fierce on maintaining uh, mandates and goals, aggressive goals for climate, but that we really allow technology to develop without attempting to pick winners and losers when we don't know yet enough about the developments that will occur. My other wish is that we all will tolerate differing points of view on the best way to get there rather than insisting that our own point of view is really the only way that we can get there. So that's my Hope, I, I can't tell you how impressive this panel is. You, I, I had very high expectations and you exceeded them long ago. And by just the sheer number of questions we've received, I apologize to the audience. So many great questions, I wasn't able to get to them all, but uh, you really did a splendid job of responding. We really appreciate your precious time today. And again, on behalf of the audience, I'm gonna give you this time uh, a standing ovation. <laughs> and we hope, uh, we hope to be able to welcome you back with Keystone uh, at some point in the next year. This was so rich. So I wish everyone a great day today and thank you so much to our panelists. Bye now. Holidays, stay safe. Bye-bye, happy holidays. <laughs>